right, thank you all thank so you. much for coming. My name is Madison, and I'm a DeFi market strategist at Consensus. You probably know about MetaMask, which is one of Consensus's products. I'm here today with a great set of panelists who I'm gonna briefly let introduce themselves, and we're going to talk about investing in DeFi. Hi guys, my name is Nassim Olive. I'm one of the co-founders and partners at Eterna Capital. We are an um, early stage investment firm focusing purely on crypto and, and blockchain. Uh, the team is mostly based in Europe. Um, and um, you know, I'm looking forward to that panel. My name is Darius. I'm the uh, founder of QCP Capital. Uh, we are a trading company. Um, we do. Uh, we focus a lot on options and derivatives. We trade across exchanges, uh, OTC, and increasingly DeFi as well. Uh, we also do a lot of early stage uh, ventures, and uh, DeFi has been a very big focus for us. My name is Mark Weinstein. I'm a partner at Mechanism Capital. Uh, similar to DeFi Capital, we do a lot of early stage investing across the ecosystem. Our primary focus was originally DeFi. Uh, at the end of last year, we moved heavily into the play to earn gaming space and NFTs. Um, we continue to just invest in infrastructure, cross chain. Um, actually, a MetaMask competitor called XDeFi, which launched cross chain infrastructure for, um, for, uh, for swapping assets across chain, as I just said like five times. Um, that's really it. I'm Mark. Hi. Hey guys, really nice to be here. I know uh, Jim Jones was just now, so we're gonna try to like keep up, keep up all the all the hype. But if we can't, I'm, I apologize in advance. Uh, so my name is Leo Masika. I'm the founder and managing partner at Edenblock. Uh, we're a very early stage VC. Uh, we specialize in decentralized infrastructure um, that you know again enables all kinds of use cases, including DeFi. Um, really, really glad to be here with all these amazing speakers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, y'all. I'm going to start out with governance, and specifically governance in DeFi. We're still pretty early stages in the sense that activism within governance, where there's a significant divergence between, let's call it, the various venture capital stakeholders and the founding team, has really occurred. But what's interesting is that, let's call, um, let, let's say that DeFi protocols on average are down between 50 and 90 percent versus ETH over the past six months. Uh, many of them have not introduced any sort of um, token accrual values that allowed the governance token holders to generate revenue. And arguably, some of the founding teams have decided to focus on maybe other areas that aren't sort of maximizing that token holder value. So at what point do you think that there will be a significant divergence between the large stakeholders of these DeFi protocols, usually the founding teams and their largest backers? I think, I think one of the biggest challenges um, being a crypto investor as well as being a crypto founder uh, is that we live in a world with open source code. And so when, when an asset gets to a certain asset price, right, we're talking about multi-billion dollar valuations for some of these DeFi protocols, um, there start to become a lot of copycats. And the code is readily available for those copycats to ship. You know, the original vampire attack that we can think of is probably Sushi Swap on Uniswap back last year, which was actually massively successful for the SushiSwap team and their investors. And so what you see happening is basically like, if these DeFi protocols don't want to create value for existing token holders, the token holders are going to move elsewhere. The attention span in crypto is very, is very low, and a lot, of these, a lot of these large holders are actually not venture funds like us who came in early who have locked up assets, right, like for two year, four year vesting. These are hedge funds that came in and invested in the token early on. And they're going to flip out of it to another asset that launches at, say, you know, 50 to $100 million valuation because they're just everything in crypto in this market right now is valued based on relative valuation metrics. So if they're saying, oh, Uniswap is valued at $4 billion, this is going to be the Uniswap on Solana, then they can either keep their capital in Uniswap and basically risk, you know, a 50% downside for maybe a 2x upside in the short term, or they can go invest in that Uniswap competitor on Solana at a $50 million valuation, where the upside is that $4 billion Uniswap valuation, right? And it gets memed into existence. So I think that um, existing DeFi founders really struggle, and it's it's not a challenge that, you know, it's something that I that I sympathize with for them because Basically, they have to hold the attention of an industry that has ADD and an industry that has huge opportunities to generate multiples on invested capital in other areas. 
No, I, I agree with Mark. Um, I mean, value accrual on tokens is always a difficult thing. But I think that, uh, you know, the founders are, will be increasing. I mean, the market's been good. Everything's been going up. But I think, you know, if we have a squeeze on, on, some, on the capital at some point, uh, and the in investors become a bit more discerning, you know, value accrual is a very important thing. Uh, and something that we place a lot of importance on as well. Yeah, I think just to add on, on both your points here, um, something that the venture capital model has always captured really well is alignment of incentives. And now I think in, D in DeFi and when it comes to token distributions and all of these things, we're seeing less and less of an aligned incentive between you know, the ones that are enabling or trying to accelerate innovation venture capitalists, you know, mostly, or nowadays there's a lot of capital coming in, but um, yeah, v VCs still might have this, um, I want to say pre predated notion of we want to look out for us, our LPs, and then we want to look after, you know, the, the company. And that's happened, you know, across, uh, um, I want to say this, this landscape for many, many years now. I mean, it feels like many, but it's probably like four. Um, and, and I think a, a big issue now that we're now starting to kind of run into is like, how do we align incentives between community, early backers, and, and the founders themselves that, that you just pointed out so, so accurately. So I think it's, it's now starting to become a much more active conversation. Um, and, and then obviously it's not about the early funding, it's actually what happens after that, right? And, and we've seen just like how, uh, um, I wanna say protocol owned liquidity has actually played a very, very uh, um, important role in realigning these incentives uh, to a very large extent, but we're still just at the very, very tip of the iceberg here when it comes to finding the right models that bring back this alignment of incentives over a very, very long period of time. And like, like you said, Mark, I mean, the, the attention span of this space is minimal. And so what I think founders should really, really focus on is dictating a very clear vision and goal for the, the ecosystem in the long term, and if the VCs can't fit that, if the VCs can't understand, you know, where that is going for the next, like, you know, however many years, um, then then I think that that's that's a crucial issue that that is going to come a lot more to to our attention as as an industry. I, t I totally agree with what the guys have covered here, and my answer is going to be quite short because I'm, I'm conscious that the panel is 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 just 25 minutes. Um, but the way the way we look at this is like you know still very early stage um, in crypto generally speaking uh, DeFi is even more early stage before 2020 you know pretty much no one's talking about it um, it used to be a couple of hundred millions uh, in TVL locked and today we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars in TVL locked so for me it's a, I see this as a sort of iterative process where we have to improve models rather than assuming that the models have been implemented from a governance standpoint as an example um, are the ones that are here to stay so um, and, and we quite you know we, we love when founders come with ideas that you know rethink current models rather than being you know an Aave on Solana and Aave on Algorand you know I don't want a copycat on another blockchain I want something that looks at it Yes, the model makes sense, it's interesting, but try to rethink about the governance and, and, and the tokenomics around it and make sure that VCs, communities, users, everyone is aligned. Because at the end of the day, I see DeFi as something that CeFi did not, um, did not offer, is you know, offer a service that is available to the wider population, to everyone, right? We, at the end of the day, crypto is, you know, um, Banking the unbanked and DeFi is a way of is the service that allow you to do that. That that's that's the way I see it. Yeah, and you know that's a great point you all brought up. And so let's talk a little bit about how, especially in a market that we're in today, where capital is so flush, how VCs are really adding value um, outside of just capital itself. So you know, multi-coin term did generalized mining. I don't think that term is still around anymore, but. You know, some of the interesting ways that I've seen VCs additionally add value have been, um, you know, there was a, one of the venture capital investors in Compound is the one who set up the discourse forum where all the governance discussions happen uh, regarding Compound that they can then obviously effectively moderate and control, et cetera. Where do you really see the value add of um, VCs contributing to projects beyond just governance, beyond just capital in an actual development capacity or in an additional tooling capacity? 
Yeah, for, for me, what I see, you know, one of the great examples is, I think, is Arca, who was quite heavily involved on, on SushiSwap. Um, how, you know, SushiSwap brought up to the community um, um, a proposal um, to change um, how things work. Um, I don't remember exactly the specifics, but the way Arca approached that is, guys, you know, wait a minute. Um, and, and think about the community, think about everyone before making any change. And I think this is so f is fundamentally important because sometimes founders can be lost in, you know, th they're doing it day to day uh, in silos and, and, you know, they can be making mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, so I see VCs with a lot of experience and competence bringing a lot of value on that front rather than capital because capital, you know, there's plenty of capital in this space nowadays. Uh, probably not enough, but you know it's it's growing at a very fast pace. Um, so you know it's all this guidance around how to improve things, um, which 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 for me is you know if I'm a founder, that's really what I'm looking for when I when I get a VC on the cap table. Yeah, and I, I think another really important part here of the conversation is like, like you said, capital is no longer important, and and right now founders are looking for VCs uh, for mainly two things. Um, like you said, value add, which uh, can be a very nebulous kind of idea and concept, uh, because every single VC likes to say we add value, okay? But where the fuck are you adding value? Sorry for my French, you know, if you're gonna go and like sap liquidity and then resell it on the markets and try to bring that money back to your LPs, it's like, okay, like wh what's deeper than that? And so I think um, over the last few years, I I've really been able to see that founders find the most value from VCs uh, when it comes to advice like very basic advice, like, hey, what did, you know, what do I do here? Like, like, how do I construct this strategy? Whether it comes to down to product, whether it comes down to, you know, again, like marketing or, or even some of the softer things, which is, again, like goes back to your values and why you're doing what you're doing and how do you communicate that in order to build a community that really, really cares about what you're doing. And so, um, you know, th th those are like kind of things above the air, but like way below the ground, there's, the most fundamental things like running infrastructure. You know, we, we've got, um, I believe, Ve yeah, Vega here in my portfolio is just sitting here. Um, and you know, we, we've, we've like, again, had to, when a new chain is built, especially a Tendermint chain, you know, that needs to be validated. That needs to be, uh, um, you could say, battle tested. And so a lot of the VC's job now is to uh, uh, cater to the very basic infrastructural kind of needs of these protocols, be good stewards to these networks, and also, you know, on a more personal and, and obviously uh, uh, probably earlier in the stage, um, provide very, very good advice that, again, comes with, like, I, I gotta be honest, like, VCs have seen a lot more than founders by, by now, it's, you know, the, act, the, the active ones, um, and so they can really help when it comes to advice. They can really provide um, some kind of context that a lot of founders usually don't have. And so, yeah, it's like the software things and then the very infrastructural things that I think VCs can be of help. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great response, by the way. And I think, you know, like there is this trope, like how can I help you, right? Like I actually have it posted in our founders Telegram channel as like just like a, a little nod to the fact that at the end of the day, the builders are building and, you know, you want VCs that are going to be almost like air support. Right, so the high level view of the market is one area. I think there are actually specific topics for founders in crypto where your life as a founder in traditional startup world is already extremely challenging. Um, but now you're a venture backed private company or protocol that's launching it, a publicly traded asset into a community predominantly, you know, usually consisting of short term traders um, and liquidity providers who want number go up, right? And there are kind of the minority of community members who are extremely passionate users of your product who believe in the future of your product. And so the question for founders in this position is how do you design your protocol in a way that is going to incentivize long-term pro-social behavior? And I think as VCs, we've seen so many launches for our companies and we're still in this iterative mode of how can we experiment with different launch structures, right? Like we were early into, um, into an algor algorithmic stable coin called ESD, which, which crashed, right? It didn't work. Um, and then if you look at kind of what was born out of that, there's Frax Finance, which is still going strong today out of that cohort of algorithmic stable coins. And what are the lessons from Frax relative to ESD that we saw? 
and how are they managing their liquidity? And when something like Olympus comes out and they launch their Olympus Pro treasury management product, but most builders are probably saying, oh, this is just like a meme, it's a Ponzi, et cetera. You know, we're there to say, actually, this is an interesting way for you to manage your treasury and to maximize value out of it, right? And so I think those are kind of like high level areas. Just a couple of specifics and then I'll stop talking. Hiring is extremely instrumental. Whenever I send one resume to a founder, they're, they're grateful. FaceTime, it sounds stupid, but just getting on a phone call with a founder for an hour every month is like invaluable to them because oftentimes they're in silos. Um, on the liquidity side, centralized exchanges, relationships, market makers, understanding market maker contracts. Man, the market makers will rip your face off. Sorry to my friends at these market makers, you guys are awesome, we need you, but they'll rip your face off as a founder if you don't know what you're talking about in that agreement. Um, and then with that as well, just like how to structure your decks, liquidity, et cetera. We try to work with our founders on all of these things. It's difficult, we're a startup fund, so we're scaling as well, but we do our best, and we actually care about the teams that are building. Yeah, just to continue the uh, VC show. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think the founder input, I mean, the VC input is quite important, right? I mean, we. we we were seed investors in XC Infinity and, and we were very proud of helping them to structure their governance token, which has been ex extremely successful. Uh, but, but beyond that, I mean, beyond just advice, I think, you know, um, like, like Mark alluded to, uh, I mean, for us, we, we bring a bit of a, a different approach to it as well because we are a trading firm as well. Uh, not market makers, so, you know, uh, I'm not offended. Um, but, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, structured products, derivatives, and we, we help to add value to the token by creating token markets, uh, options on the markets, derivatives on the markets, and I think that's, that's helpful as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm also interested to hear, um, you know, with the rise of DeFi, um, especially in, in, you know, the rise of the market overall, whether it's NFTs, but, in, you know, especially DeFi since it's attracting a different type of institutional crowd, how has the allocator base into VCs changed over this past year? Who are you seeing now? Is it still predominantly ultra high net worth individuals, family offices? Are you starting to get the more aggressive endowments or pension funds or even sovereign wealth funds on maybe the largest VC funds in the space are attracting that kind of capital? It would be really interesting to hear how that sort of capital allocation process has changed and who's interested today versus yesterday. Maybe I'll start with this one. Actually, the most interesting thing I think everyone on the stage will agree with me is that uh, the uh, VC founders have increasingly made the VC more private. Uh, we want to take more, bigger percentage of the VC uh, to have more control and, and, and I mean to get more upside as well. Um, but yes, to, to, you know, we are seeing uh, a lot of traditional finance guys seriously FOMO in. Um, you know, uh, the, the VC play has taken, has overshadowed the, the macro hedge fund type of play uh, purely because you have the 100,000 X kind of, kind of returns. Um, and these guys are allocating big sizes, right? I mean, just, just yesterday there was an announcement of a $1.5 billion LGO VC fund, right? Uh, I mean, it's getting a bit nuts. So I think for us, it's actually a, a, a fight to, to retain more of, our, of, of, of the fund rather than, than, than allocating it out. Yeah, so we're, we're um, all partner capital proprietary shops, so we don't have LPs. Um, but we do see a lot of institutions coming into this space. There was a $30 billion um, tech-focused hedge fund that were doing a lot of kind of pre-IPO pre deals that messaged me they want a crypto strategy. Every major VC has a crypto strategy now. Their LPs are asking for it. They need it. These are you know, 15, $20 billion you know, establishments that have been around for decades. So in terms of like the types of capital, I think at this point, we've crossed the chasm of if you have crypto exposure and it goes down, you're gonna lose your job as a high level capital allocator to if you don't have crypto exposure, people are going to ask you, their, their partners, right? And fund of funds or you know, the managers at endowments or pensions are gonna say, why don't we have a crypto strategy? What is our crypto strategy? And they might lose the job the other way. From the standpoint of what that means for founders, because I think this is an important, important question, you now have different pools of capital that you can tap into. So you have like the Tiger Globals of the world, who are hedge funds that are coming in, pushing valuations as high as they can, not doing diligence, effectively making an index play on late stage technology, and that's happening now in crypto. We're seeing a lot of kind of more hedge fund oriented players coming in, pushing up valuations, moving very quickly. You're gonna have the traditional VCs that offer 
all of this operational support. So they have huge back offices. You know, they can support you in setting up your legal, in PR, in marketing, the hiring pipeline that I mentioned. They're coming from the top. Then you have DAOs, right, and angels. And in crypto, you know, an angel investor, like my, my friends, the Lao twins, who call themselves angel investors, you know, they're a fund, effectively. They don't have LP capital, but they operate like a fund. And so now you have crypto VCs getting squeezed from the top and the bottom, and the market is getting much, much more competitive. Great news for founders, right? Like, test the market, make hay when the sun is shining, go raise capital, because it's absolutely liquid and bananas out there right now. Yeah, and an another thing to, to kind of note is, is like, there is so much provability for what we're doing now. Like, this is, this is not 2017 anymore. You know, uh, uh, DeFi is, is provably the fastest growing industry, uh, um, probably one of them in, in the entire world, in our entire history as, as people. And I think that, like, that produces so much pressure to, on, on founders, one, to perform, and then, you know, to also raise money. And I actually think that, like, this entire injection of capital, whether it's institutional capital or private capital or angel capital or VC capital or, you know, just a bunch of people that invested in, you know, Bitcoin and, and now they're VCs. There's so many of them, right? Um, it's like, it all goes back to, okay, where the hell is the talent? And every single team, and you were talking about hiring just now, like every single team in our portfolio is having a huge issue finding people to hire because they know that the pressure's on. They know that this like, like entire, you know, hey, let's put $5 billion into, you know, crypto gaming, you know, in one quarter. It's like, okay, how much of that is left? It's like, that's gonna run out when people start, you know, start to like misperform. When, when like you've, you've got the first like amazing, huge, like, you know, big crypto company that was too big for its own good that raised like $200 million and just miserably fails. And that's probably gonna happen at some point, right? Like it didn't happen until now because we didn't have that kind of capital like so eager to get into the space. Uh, we've seen it, you know, across like DeFi protocols and stuff like that, but now, you know, like teams are, are really, really feeling the heat. And so that I think is gonna produce probably some of the most successful companies and, and, and protocols in the entire universe, really in the next like few years. And it's also gonna kind of just recurb our enthusiasm for a little bit, right? Uh, um, because, because again, it's like right now, like seed fund, you know, seed founding, uh, um, kind of rounds are, are being raised at valuations of like a hundred million dollars. No product, like you know, you, you've got a piece of paper with a couple of proofs, and even them are like, yeah, it's like, all right, like what, what do you want me to do with this? You know, um, obviously I'm being squeezed out here because I care about my investment. I want to do my due diligence, and you're telling me that I have three days to make an investment. You know, on a hundred million dollar valuation, I haven't even read anything. You know, it's like, okay, I, I understand where we are. There's a just to be clear, there's a lot of top signals right now in the space, okay? A ton of top signals. And you're seeing it all across the space, especially in the investment landscape. So, like, my, my, my kind of advice on top of yours um, is like, yeah, founders better perform. Like, yeah, go and raise all the money you can because now's the time, but also think about where you're gonna find your talent, where you're gonna, like, hire from, and where you're gonna grow uh, because, you know, money is not the issue. It's all about, like, provability um, and sustaining that. I know we just have three minutes left, so I'm gonna just give a, a one minute quick answer. Um, we started four years ago, and I've said the, the space have, has evolved dramatically from a technology standpoint, but from a, from a fundraising standpoint as a VC and trying to get um, more institutional type uh, capital coming in has just been so, it has evolved at a very rapid pace. Uh, four years ago, trying to get LPs from, you know, capital from, you know, endowments, pension funds, uh, foundations, whatever, was just, you know, a way, to be honest, almost a waste of time, I would say. So we spent ourselves hundreds of hours trying to educate, going at sessions, talking to private banks, trying to tell them what is this all about. And it starts from what is Bitcoin, uh, and the double spending concept all the way to the potential applications. Today, the conversation has completely shifted. DeFi, NFT, we're seeing so much 
proper use cases of the technology, and everyone is is jumping on on that boat. I think also macroeconomics uh, have a have a role to play because you know everyone is seeking some yield, and the reality is, the more you move on the on the risk uh, spectrum, the more you realize you know okay, what is the risk return um, you know. Uh, kind of profile of the asset class and I think it's so asymmetric that it just makes sense for everyone to have an element of exposure to it. Now try to convince invest investment committees about this, obviously it's a big challenge, uh, but they're listening which is a very, very positive sign. I know in the US it's a different story compared to Europe where we raise our capital, uh, but people are starting to listen and, and take proper actions. Awesome, well uh, I think we're out of time but thank you all so much. Let's give a round of applause for all the panelists.